So but these, yeah. these, you don't know who to deal with. <laughs> these, as uh, the Catch a Predator clips have gone extremely viral on YouTube. I urge people to go and support Chris's channel. He's got a channel as well. Go over there and check what he's got out there and please subscribe. But my question is, I just rewatched a bunch of the clips and I'm just still mind blown and flabbergasted by this character that brought the kill kit. Could oh, you just tell the, people a bit about that one? Sure. So, Sean, and thank you for uh, reminding people that the new episodes that we're doing uh, most recently in Michigan are out on the, the uh, YouTube channel. I have a seat with Chris Hansen out right now. But, um, yeah, in one of the recent investigations about five years ago, we were in Fairfield, Connecticut, and we had 11 men surface over the period of three days. And one of them was a guy who worked for – the cable company. So he was in people's homes on a daily basis, you know, dealing with women and children and, and uh, having free reign in their homes in some cases. And he also was on the list to become a police officer in the state of Connecticut, having gone through the police academy. He shows up to meet a 13-year-old girl in his mind, a decoy posing as a 13-year-old girl in reality. And I confront him. We have a discussion. He claims he wasn't going to do anything except give this 13-year-old girl a driving lesson in a nearby parking lot. He leaves. The police search the car, and inside the car is duct tape, rope, a video camera, and a loaded handgun. So what do you suppose is going to happen if he takes a 13-year-old girl for a driving lesson in, uh, in Connecticut? Probably nothing good is my guess. What happened to him? He, like so many others, um, pleaded guilty and received, um, <clears throat> uh, I think it was a four-year sentence with a few years uh, suspended, and uh, had to register as a sex offender and is on the radar of, uh, of uh, state authorities because of that. I mean, he's not going to be a police officer, that's for sure. But, you know, y y you wonder, I mean, think about this, Sean. Last month was the 17th anniversary of the very first predator investigation. Now, I thought in the very beginning that we would do two or three and people would get hip to this and never show up again. You know, a month ago, a month and a half ago in Michigan, uh, we did another investigation. We had a state prison guard surface, uh, a Michigan state contractor who had done work in the governor's mansion a former police officer from Lebanon and a, a, an engineer from the auto industry all surfaced to meet a 13, 14, 15 year old kid. And it's shocking. The other one that flabbergasted me was the predator who showed up to meet what he thought was a boy, a teenage boy to have, let's just say relations with and brought his little kid with him. That was probably, people always ask what was the most disturbing moment and this guy showed up in our Fort Myers, Florida investigation. And it was the last predator on the last day of the investigation. It was uh, a Sunday. And we knew he was coming. And we're watching on the remote uh, screens. He pulls up in a blue-green SUV. And he goes to the driver's side rear door. And we think he's going to get pizza or beer or whatever. And he's there to meet a 14-year-old boy. And he leads out his toddler son by the hand and walks him up the driveway. And, and now I'm with a crew of guys uh, and gals, Sean, who've been with me for years, who've worked all kinds of investigations in all kinds of dark corners of the world. And there was a collective sigh, just, a, just a, a sense of how could this possibly be happening? And he walks in with his child. And I'm trying to think, okay, what's the appropriate way of handling this? You don't want to let him off the hook, but you don't want to traumatize the child, obviously. And I said, look, you know why you're here. I know why you're here. Uh, you have your child with you. I'm not going to make this any worse than your child. Um, why don't you just get going? And, and as he left, the police, the female police officer swooped up the child and um, they arrested him. The postscript to that story is and we'll be getting into that into in one of the future episodes of predators i've caught the podcast is that the state pending his prosecution uh child services 
uh, said that he had to move out of the house, that he couldn't be around the, the, his child. There was no allegation that he abused that child or was going to involve that child in the abuse that he intended upon the 14-year-old boy that he thought was there. But he moved out and ultimately was able to finagle his way back into that house with his wife by the wife sending that child to live with a relative so he could be in that house. They went on to have another child. And Department of Child and Family Services which has to be very careful about public statements on this, people were so offended that they're reaching out to me on the QT to keep me posted because they're just, they're incredulous that human beings could act this way. And ultimately he was, he was convicted and served prison time as well. And you had a couple of the guys showed up and just got completely naked and walked in the house naked. What possessed them to do that? Well, the, the decoys have different profiles. Some are very conservative and shy. Some are a little more cheeky, let's say. So in one case, in our second investigation in, in uh, a suburb of Washington, D.C., the decoy said it'd be hot if you stripped in the garage and walked in naked. Now, we didn't think he was going to actually do it. There's a <laughs> fellow named John Canelli who was, had the, the screen name Special Guy 29, and he was neither 29 nor special, as it turned out. But he, he, he went in the garage. We had a camera. We didn't have a camera in the garage at the moment. We put one out there so we could see. And he stripped, walked in, and the producers had put a towel on top of the refrigerator, which I had to pass on the way to the kitchen counter where we had the interrogation. And uh, it, was just, it was just stunning. And to kick it to another level, this guy um shows up the next day in another chat room trying to hook up with another 13 14 year old boy and the the decoy set up a date at a mcdonald's and we showed up we left the predator house to to confront him at the mcdonald's he walks in we see him he walks out and i'm there with the crew and he's stunned of course and, and i said you know i don't know what to ask you first uh, I've been in this business for a long time and I'm very seldom at a loss for words, but I, I just don't know. And he said, well, I'm getting help. I said, well, John, I got news for you. It's not working. And he went off and, and uh, you know, in those days, in that second investigation, again, we weren't doing a parallel investigation with uh, law enforcement. So ultimately he was prosecuted and some of the other cases in that investigation were prosecuted, but it wasn't until the third um, investigation where uh, a sheriff's department or a police department uh, or a task force would work in uh, in parallel to uh, to make sure these cases were in fact prosecuted. So, what sentence range is did the predators get in the end? It ranges from probation and uh, registration as a sex offender on the low end, uh, monitoring uh, all the way up to I think the the highest sentence I believe was around twenty four years uh, in prison. And some of these people have reoffended and then been sent back for longer sentences. The rabbi who surfaced famously in the suburban Washington, D.C. investigation is back in, I'm told, for a sixth time after getting dusted up and violating his uh, his parole uh, probation after uh, after, you know, being busted back in, you know, 16, 17, 16 years ago. He's been in and out five, six times now. For the 24-year person, was the serious aggravating circumstances? Yeah. So there was, uh, in the one case, um, a fellow was convicted twice before of, um, of uh, statutory rape and uh, um, sexual solicitation of a child. So anytime somebody's caught with a past, they're going to get a much higher sentence. If it's the first time, you know, in the court's eyes, it'll be, you know, I've seen it go up to 10 years, and I've seen it as little as probation, depending on the circumstances. Just got a couple of minutes left. You've got a few questions coming from the viewers. Sure. What are the ages of the decoys? I assume they must be 18 or over. Therefore, the predators are speaking to someone who is pretending to be 13, for example, it's from Tim Wilson. That's exactly right. Um, the, the two sets of decoys. There's the decoy that goes online and has the chat posing as a child. And then we typically have decoys in person who greet the potential predator at the location or send pictures. And those typically are uh, 18, 19 year old young men, young women who 
um, look particularly young who um, maybe some cases are theater students or police cadets or young police officers or sheriff's deputies who, who are very skilled at, at pulling off this kind of work. Um, it doesn't matter because if the, you know, if it's clear that the decoy says and identifies himself or herself as being underage and, and doesn't indicate that they're in any sort of role-playing situation, the solicitation actually takes place, the crime takes place online. So the transcripts are the transcripts, you have them there. You have the initial approach, you have the initial discussion of, of uh, sex with a minor. And showing up is really just you know, proof that the crime occurred. You know, that's that's the, the television part of it in many cases. So, but the crime actually takes place in most states online before they even show up. Do the decoys need any special training or special aftercare counseling, for example, after dealing with these sickos? Well, I think some have. Um, you know, people who do this sort of decor work online for any period of time, um, most law enforcement agencies will require that they do some sort of debriefing and some sort of counseling. And, and in many cases, you know, they're exposed to uh, porn and, and uh, occasionally child porn, and, and that takes its toll on somebody after a while. So, so yeah, they, they rotate in and out and they get new people to do it. But um, it takes a, takes a special breed to be able to do it. It's important work, but it's, it's not, not for everybody, you know. Yeah, really commendable. So Hesse has asked, have you ever encountered any female predators in your work? You know, it's a great question. I've never had one surface in one of our actual investigations. We've had um, situations where we see the teacher student and the psychiatrist, the experts tell us that typically when it comes to female predators, you're more likely to see that because of the predator. The woman doesn't like the anonymity where the, the male predator feeds off the anonymity and the, the fantasy and the vision of who this child may be and who, who they think they're going to end up uh, meeting in person. So before we wrap up then, what are your plans for the future? Well, we're, we're um, getting ready to do more predator investigations. Um, we're in discussions with uh, some of the television networks right now as to where that's going to end up. We've got a little bit of a different format that I think will be creative and interesting to people. We have some of the new investigations right now on the YouTube channel. Have a seat with Chris Hansen. And, um, you know, we've got the two very important projects on Discovery Plus right now, which is uh, Unseemly, the Peter Nygaard investigation, and Onision in Real Life, which is an eye-opening look at a YouTube predator uh, who has been operating for better than a decade. So I urge people to go over and support Chris on YouTube. Is there anywhere else you would like the viewers to support you? Discovery Plus, YouTube, have a seat with Chris Hansen. Predators I've Caught, it's on Apple Podcasts right now. And anywhere else you get your podcasts. And we'll have all those links in the description box below the video. It's always a great pleasure, Chris. You have Sean, been... always a pleasure to be here. Sorry for the technical uh, technical uh, glitch getting started. But once we got rolling, <laughs> I thought it worked out all right. You have a great rest of your evening then. Thanks, Sean. Take care. Thank you. Bye. All right. Yeah. Great chat with Chris. And this really reinforces our mission statement. End the war on drugs. Take all those resources. Go after the freaking predators. Because what did he say? A guy with a kill kit showed up with a kill kit. Got what? Four years. I had to serve two, three years. This guy had duct tape, a loaded gun, other things in this kill kit. <sighs> I urge you to go on YouTube and find the kill kit clip. And you tell me on the next live stream what kind of a sentence you think the sicko with a kill kit who was trying to get this girl out the house. He was like, get in my car, get in my car. What kind of sentence do you think that person should have got versus what Chris just told us? Because that is absolutely sickening. The whole justice system is upside down. The lowest hanging fruit, the low level drug users, people with addiction issues, soldiers coming back from wars, the mentally ill. 
That's how they filled the private prisons, lowest hanging fruit. And the cops are telling us they haven't got the resources to go after the predators. Well, Chris is doing your bloody job. Get on with it. And judges, give them big sentences. Four years getting out after two or three years is not enough. If he was going out there to kill someone, oh my goodness, should have got at least double digits.